Where did matter, the stuff we're made from, ultimately come from? It's a question that's driven scientists and natural philosophers for centuries, but it's only in the last few decades that we've gotten close to an answer. In this video, I'm going to explore what modern physics tells us about matter's ultimate origins, and the answer may surprise you. Let's begin with something familiar. You and I, the world around us, all the stars and planets we can see in the night sky are made of atoms. Atoms like carbon, oxygen and nitrogen. Where did those atoms come from? Well, as Carl Sagan said, The nitrogen in our DNA, the calcium in our teeth, the iron in our blood, the carbon in our apple pies were made in the interiors of collapsing stars. We are made of star stuff. And that's true. The stars take hydrogen as their raw material and forge the heavier elements in their cores through nuclear fusion, joining hydrogen nuclei together to make helium, helium to make carbon, and so on and so on, until you've got all the elements in the periodic table. Over the past 13.7-ish billion years, generations upon generations of stars have gradually enriched the universe in the heavier elements. But go back far enough to around 100 million years after the Big Bang, and there were no stars. The universe was dark, filled with a warm hydrogen-helium fog, the raw material from which the very first stars would form. Where then did this raw material ultimately come from? The answer is the fireball of the Big Bang. The helium atoms, which make up about a quarter of the atoms in the universe by mass, were forged in the first 3 to 20 minutes of the Big Bang, when temperatures were hot enough to fuse raw protons and neutrons together to make helium nuclei, which are made of two protons and two neutrons each. But what if we go even further and ask where those protons and neutrons came from? Well, go back even further to around a millionth of a second after the Big Bang, and temperatures were so high, around a trillion degrees Celsius, that no protons and neutrons existed. Instead, the entire universe was filled with a superheated soup of quarks and gluons. As the universe expanded and cooled, that soup then congealed to form the very first protons and neutrons. That means that earlier than about a millionth of a second after the Big Bang, we had a universe that was filled with a searing plasma of quarks, electrons and gluons, the fundamental particles that would go on to make all the matter in the world around us. Now, as far as we know, quarks and electrons are fundamental particles. That means they don't have any internal structure and aren't made of anything smaller. So where did those fundamental ingredients ultimately come from? Did they even come from anywhere? Were they always there? To answer that question, we need to consider precisely what we mean by a quark or an electron, or indeed any fundamental particle. It may seem strange, but in a sense, fundamental particles aren't really fundamental. It may be tempting to think of them as little balls whizzing about in space, but that isn't right. What modern physics tells us is that fundamental particles are actually aspects of deeper, more fundamental objects, quantum fields. Quantum fields pervade the entire universe. You can think of them as a bit like invisible oceans. And every fundamental particle is nothing more than a little vibration or ripple in an underlying quantum field. So, for example, an electron is a ripple in something called the electron field. The quarks are ripples in quark fields, and so on. So to make a quark or an electron, you just need to inject some energy into the quark or electron field. It's a bit like throwing a stone into a pond, creating a ripple on the surface. But there is a bit of a problem here. Quarks and electrons are matter particles, or what we call fermions, and it's not possible to create a fermion on its own. Instead, when you inject some energy into a fermion field, you always create two particles, a fermion and an anti-fermion. That means whenever you create, say, an electron, you also make its antiparticle an anti-electron. In other words, whenever we create matter, we also have to create an equal quantity of antimatter. Now, this raises a bit of a problem, because when we look around the universe today, we see that it is made almost entirely of ordinary matter. How matter won out over antimatter during the Big Bang is one of the biggest mysteries in physics. I'll save that for a future video, but what we can say for now is that the electrons and quarks that make up the matter in the world around us ultimately came from energy being injected into the electron and quark fields. The question then is, where did this energy ultimately come from? 
The answer is perhaps surprising. In the old-fashioned description of the history of the universe, if you go far back enough, eventually you reach something called the Big Bang Singularity, a time when everything in the universe was crushed into a single point of infinite density and infinite temperature. The Big Bang Singularity defines time zero, the very beginning of the universe. And in this old-fashioned view, all the energy that would ultimately go on to create the physical universe around us was contained in this initial singularity. However, despite this idea still getting a lot of airtime in popular discussions of the history of the universe, it's actually really pretty outdated. Modern cosmology did away with the Big Bang Singularity long ago. Why? Well, it's all down to a process known as inflation. Now, I'm not talking about the rising price of a bottle of milk. I'm talking about cosmic inflation. But before we get into inflation, I just want to take a short break to say if you are enjoying this video, please do like and subscribe. And I'd also like to mention that I've got a new book coming out in March 2024 called Space Oddities, which is all about a series of puzzling anomalies that could be offering us the first clues to a profound new view of the universe. You can find a link to pre-order below. But now back to the video. The concept of inflation emerged in the late 1970s to address a number of problems that were confounding cosmologists at the time. One particularly troublesome issue was known as the horizon problem, which in essence is the fact that no matter which direction you look, the universe looks pretty much the same. In particular, if you study the cosmic microwave background, which is the light left over from the fireball of the Big Bang, you find that no matter which direction you look, it has almost exactly the same temperature. In fact, it's the same to one part in a hundred thousand. Now, that is really weird because two opposite patches of sky were so far apart that they have never been in causal contact. In other words, they have no way of talking to each other or exchanging energy, say, by firing photons backwards and forwards. So how do they end up at the same temperature? Inflation solves this problem by imagining that the entire observable universe was once a tiny patch of space with the same temperature and the same density. This tiny causally connected region then underwent a period of indescribably rapid expansion, technically what we call exponential expansion, where the universe ballooned in size by at least a factor of 10 to the power 26. That's 100 trillion trillion times in size in around 10 to the minus 32 seconds. Now, those are admittedly some pretty stupid numbers, but to try to put that in some kind of context, if you took a tennis ball and blew it up by the same factor, it would end up 10,000 times bigger than the entire Milky Way galaxy. So the basic idea at the core of inflation is that you have this tiny patch of space with the same temperature and density, and then you blow it up across the entire sky. And that explains why, no matter which direction we look, the universe looks pretty much the same. Cosmic inflation is now a core part of the standard cosmological model, the accepted story of the history of our universe. But what's it got to do with the origins of matter? Well, one obvious question is to ask, what made inflation happen? The short answer is, we don't really know. But what cosmologists generally imagine is that inflation was driven by a special field known as the inflaton. Yes, I know physicists shouldn't be allowed to name things, but the basic idea is this inflaton contained a vast amount of energy, and it was that energy that drove the universe to expand incredibly rapidly. However, inflation can't have gone on forever, otherwise we wouldn't be here. The reason is that the inflaton was unstable and ultimately decayed into other fundamental particles. That vast well of energy that was driving the expansion of the universe was dumped into all the quantum fields in nature, creating an almighty splurge of subatomic particles, filling what up to that point had been a howling, gasping void with a searing subatomic fire. This cosmologists believe, was the ultimate origin of matter. Everything in the world around us, every star, every planet, every speck of dust, and you and me, ultimately came from the awesome power that drove the inflation of the universe in its very earliest moments.